Hey friends, welcome back. So we're going to talk about two recently published studies, and this might in fact be one of the most important videos we've made about COVID-19 up to now. We're going to talk about a recently published study that found that repeated immunizations from the mRNA vaccines actually pivot your adaptive immune system to make non-neutralizing antibodies. Remember how important we heard health officials and pundits say the reason why you need boosters is to get your antibodies as high as possible. Well, it turns out that there's four different subtypes of your IgG antibodies. The first three are protective. The last one is non-neutralizing. The last one is saying, hey, look, we've seen this antigen, i.e. the spike protein, or in the case of beekeepers, this, this data of IgG subclass switching has been talked a lot about in, in people who, who keep bees and they're constantly stung by bees. And so the immune system says, look, we're going to see this antigen all the time. So what we're going to do is instead of making these protective IgG antibodies, what we're going to do is we're going to pivot the immune system to make non-neutralizing antibodies because you see it so much, it probably doesn't matter, right? And so what this study showed in healthcare workers is there was a linear increase in the number of immunizations linked with a percentage of the IgG antibodies that switched to this non-neutralizing IgG4 antibody, which this is damning. This should really cause us to rethink our, our health campaign, especially for young people who are going to see COVID for the rest of their life. This is never going away. So if repeated exposure to the spike protein by way of immunization or just natural infection causes this class switching, which might make a repeat infection more severe, then what we should be doing is promoting health and really backing off, especially in applying risk stratification when it comes to repeated booster shots and immunizations. As you can see here in figure two, they show that there is a dramatic switch from neutralizing IgG antibodies to this non-neutralizing IgG4 subclass, you can see here. And what they show is that there was no detectable levels of IgG4 non-neutralizing antibodies before a vaccination, but they increased literally and iteratively with every successive mRNA vaccine. And the authors say, we detected spike-specific IgG4 antibodies in about half of serum samples collected from uh, five to seven months after the second immunization, all of which did not show any IgG4 antibody subtypes at earlier time points. For all IgG subclasses, a decline was seen in the same period. Now, this paper helps sort of characterize the declining efficacy that we've been seeing. And this is now, you know, Washington Post has reported on this, New York Times has reported on this, Wall Street Journal, major media outlets have said, well, why are, there was so much hype and so much promise and so much enthusiasm for the vaccines, but now we're seeing they're not working as well as we thought. Even after people have been getting multiple of these, mechanistically what's going on, this paper highlights potential mechanisms here. And that is when you repeatedly show the human immune system, the same antigen over and over and over again, there is some sort of protective mechanism where the types of IgG antibodies pivot away from protective neutralizing antibodies to this more non-neutralizing IgG4 subclass, which might be why some people are getting sicker after a reinfection, particularly if they've had multiple immunizations. Not the adenovirus vector immunizations. It's important to recognize here, uh, this study was looking specifically at the mRNA uh, vaccines. So they conclude and say, moreover, after the third immunizations, IgG4 levels sharply increased and became detectable in almost all vaccinees. Now remember, IgG4 is a subclass of IgG antibodies that is non-neutralizing. This paper should be front page news and should really influence public health policy makers uh, and companies. I mean, companies are complicit here. I know employees at Facebook and Amazon and major tech companies and so forth, even teachers, they are requiring even volunteers in classrooms or summer camps, believe it or not. Literally, I was looking at a summer camp for my daughter and there was uh, a little subtext here. Uh, your child must be up to date on all of the COVID-19 vaccinations. So we know that about 90% of kids or 95% of kids have antibodies to the nucleocapsid, which is one antigen on SARS-CoV-2. Why are we making kids when they already have adaptive immunity, by the way? Why are we making them have more immunizations, my friends? This makes no sense. As I said from the very beginning, we need to focus on health exercise, nutrition, stress reduction, circadian rhythm optimization, sleep, having meaning, purpose, like friends in your life. These are things that actually improve immune health. We've ignored that. And now we're trying to play catch up. And I don't think there is catch up. I don't think there is a solution outside of going back to the basics. And this could include incentivizing health. Instead of subsidizing corn and canola oil and sugar, why don't we subsidize gyms? Why aren't we subsidizing healthy food? These are the policy level decisions that we uh, could and should be making if we're serious about saving lives, my friends. So this 
is really important. But before we go on, friends, I just want to thank you for being here. You know, when we talk about these content, the algorithms don't really like it. So we depend on you to share this content, to hit that like button, to text this to a friend so that they get access to this information. Also, friends, we're trying to inspire health on this platform. We're not that's our main goal. So we have t-shirts, we have uh, tools to help you improve your health and also inspire meaningful conversations with people in your community. We have this shirt called eat like your life depends on it. Lift like your life depends on it. Make natural immunity count again. These are all things that when you wear in public, I can tell you friends, family, people, customers that wear these, they meet like-minded people in their communities. I want you to have those meaningful conversations to inspire change at the grassroots level. So check out our sister company, Myoscience. You can save using the code podcast on a range of health tools, including t-shirts to have these meaningful conversations. So let's talk about the recently published study that found that individuals who got reinfected with COVID have increased risk of death and all-cause mortality and severe sequela associated with that reinfection. But I think there's some limitations of this study, and this was trending on Twitter all weekend. And many people are saying, see, if you get COVID the second time or a third time, that means that you're more likely to die and suffer from all these problems. So therefore, we should reinstitute mandates. Now, the important conclusion that I think these people are not thinking about is how are you going to do that? How are you going to prevent COVID from stopping? How are you actually going to prevent getting infected with COVID? Because many people have had one, two, three, four, five vaccinations up to now. They're still getting breakthrough infections, which is why that second study is really important that we're going to talk about today. But more importantly, during the point at which we had all of these mandates, mask mandates and school closures and restrictions, guess what? We saw the highest levels of cases in the US. And I'm talking about December of 2021 and January of 2022. Go back and look at the statistics. I mean, in the state of New York, for example, in Manhattan, if you wanted to go to a bar not only did you need to show proof of immunization, not, not only did you need to also wear a mask, but some bars and restaurants required a negative COVID-19 test. Okay. That is insane. That's ridiculous. How much more extreme could we actually get? And if we look no further than the country of China, who tried myopically to attempt this zero COVID strategy, well, they just said, forget about it. Like we cannot control this virus. It's endemic. We should then now, as you know, we've talked a lot about focus on health. And that's why this study here published in Nature Medicine titled Acute and Post-Acute Sequela Associated with SARS-CoV-2 Reinfection. Now, at first you think, oh my gosh, this study is frightening because these people who got reinfected with COVID after a primary infection, well, they had all these health problems. They had an increased risk of dying and, and, and all the like. And there was you know, 5 million people as part of the study. But what you don't really recognize is the population that is being studied here are veterans, part of the VA. Now, I have several friends who are physicians that work for the VA, and they'll be the first to tell me that many of the patients they see have a lot of underlying health issues. So this is a unique subset of the population. So what people are doing on Twitter is they see this paper and they see, oh my gosh, the hazard ratios of increased all-cause mortality, death, and heart disease as a result of getting COVID again is much higher. So therefore, they conclude, we need to re-implement restrictions and masking and get our kids out of school again. That doesn't work work. That's not sustainable. This is not going away. And so that's what I want to share with you. A major limiting factor of this study that is going viral is only 12% of the study subjects were under 38 years old, meaning that 90% of the people were over 40. Now, th that doesn't represent the entire American population. Your children are going to get COVID over and over and over again. So that means that you and your children should be eating healthier foods, should be exercising, should be doing all the things to improve immune health and to decrease the underlying health conditions that are very pervasive in this population that is getting COVID again. That's major, important, major point number one. Major point number two is this sentence right here. This is what the authors say. They say the risks were evident of increased all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease-related mortality, and health challenges as a result of the reinfection, regardless of vaccination status. They said the risks were the most pronounced in the acute phase, but also persisted in the post-acute phase six months after reinfection. Okay, let's just talk about that again. They said the risks of all these health issues after reinfection were independent of one's vaccination status, which may, makes us really ponder and question, then where are we going with our current vaccination policy? If the vaccines don't prevent the transmission of the virus, as, as the authors say in Nature Medicine, this isn't some conspiracy journal, they say, the risk of increased all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality and, and complications associated with a reinfection are just as high for people who have had the vaccine compared to the people that haven't, then why are we still recommending the vaccines? Why are we recommending boosters, especially in light of this new paper we're about to talk about, about IgG subclass switching, which is just crazy. So 
They go on to say, compared to non-infected controls, cumulative risks and burdens of repeat infection increase according to the number of infections, limitations including a cohort of mostly white males. And so they say the evidence shows that reinfection further increases risk of death, hospitalization, and sequela in multiple organ systems in the acute and post-acute phase. And they say reducing overall burden of death and disease due to SARS-CoV-2 will require strategies for reinfection prevention. Okay, how are you going to do that? We've all been masked. People stay in their houses. We can no longer continue to do, do that. We've seen the iatrogenesis linked with that from inflation to supply chain issues to kids not learning as much in school to obesity, depression, drug overdoses. So how are we going to actually prevent a reinfection? Here's an alternative way to view this, this new data that does show, and I'm not saying go out there and get COVID every week, okay, by the way, and that's physiologically not possible. As we've talked about before, uh, a new study from Qatar compared natural immunity compared to vaccine-induced immunity and found actually greater rates of preventing a reinfection. So immune systems work and you can improve your ability to prevent a reinfection by in increasing your health with exercise, nutrition, stress reduction, sleep, circadian rhythm optimization, vitamin D, all the things that we should have been promoting in early part of 2020 that we actually ignored. So that's how I interpret this, this study. But again, many people on Twitter are sharing this figure one. The title here is risk and burden of sequela in people with SARS-CoV-2 reinfection versus no infection. And they're showing an increased risk of all-cause mortality, or increased risk of hospitalization, and increased risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and these things. Okay, the important thing to remember, my friends, is this population is probably already sick to begin with and an older population. So uh, yeah, you don't want to get COVID all the time. But yeah, if we improve our underlying health conditions, I bet this risk would absolutely go away. And again, to prevent the risk of a symptomatic reinfection, you can decrease that by improving your health and your lifestyle. And so the thing that I think is important about this study is not to be alarmed by this, but to take an offensive approach in terms of preventing a symptomatic reinfection by improving your life. Don't overwork. Don't under-exercise. Don't eat ultra-processed foods. Do all the things that have been shown to prevent an infection in the first place. We've shared with you many studies over the past two years that show that people who exercise compared to people who don't are less likely to test positive for COVID-19. We've shared studies about body fat percentage. People with lower body fat percentage have a lower viral load. Was this study looking at body fat percentage and stratifying people in different cohorts? But what's I think most important about this study and this hints at where we're going, is they did not enumerate or quantify and look at the different cohorts of people who were vaccinated versus unvaccinated. I think that's most important. I would love to know in this study, parsing out the cohorts of people who had severe reinfection if they were vaccinated before or unvaccinated. And thanks for watching all the way through. Hopefully you found this video helpful and the associated articles helpful as well. I will also include an article here about what IgG4 antibodies are and how they've been studied for the past 20 years and, and are really quite uh, pronounced in beekeepers and people, again, that are exposed continually to uh, venom from, from uh, bees, bee stings and things like that. So there's a lot known about these antibodies and it seems that the body, the body is so intelligent, this complex system, we cannot play God anymore. Your body knows what it's doing through years, millions of years of evolution. And uh, it seems that Again, when the body knows it's being constantly bombarded by the same antigen, instead of increasing protective antibodies that neutralize it, it's making non-neutralizing antibodies, which might make um, the infection worse or a reinfection worse. And so that remains to be determined, but time will tell. So as always, appreciate you tuning in. Thanks for hitting the like button. Thanks for sharing. We'll catch you in a future one down the road. Bye.